Dude, we haven't talked about the Trump assassination attempt. When is that going to happen? The, the third one? The third, fourth one, I think. Well, you, you know what happened, right? Like this is like the sequence of events was 10 a.m. He puts out a, a tweet on his true social and says, I hate Taylor Swift. Six hours later, someone tries to kill him. Coincidence? I don't think so. No, definitely a Swifty. Welcome to Drunk Real Estate. Grab a drink and enjoy the show. Hey there, welcome to episode 65 of Drunk Real Estate. I am Kyle Wilson, Ashley Wilson's husband, and uh, I've been told to keep this short, so I'm just going to go right into Jay. What are you drinking? <laughs> it's, it's hard to keep it short. We've been talking for 40 minutes now before we actually get this thing started. Um, I am drinking the exact same thing that I was drinking last week and will be drinking for the next two months, my case of circumference cab from Costco. Mauricio, what are you drinking? <laughs> I'm back to the Pisco, the, the nice bottle, and... Um... Ginger piss. And and that wasn't me calling you ginger piss, AJ. I'm coming to you next. AJ, what yeah, are you I drinking? I was about to say, I'm a little offended here. That's like, a, I'm a protected class here. Um, what do you think I'm drinking? Uh, a little, little Diet Coke and Red Solo. And can you be protected if you have no soul? Ooh. Oh, I can. My soul can't, though. I want to know what Mauricio is stuffing his face with. Excellent. Those are great. Those are great. Love those. Love those. Siete. Siete. Costco. Good, good pickup. Uh, Grain-free chips. All right. We got to get right into this because because apparently our intros are too long. So let's, uh, let's talk about this rate cut. Finally, guys, day has finally come, right? So this is being released Wednesday. The day has finally come when we're getting a rate cut. I don't know if you looked at the odds lately, but the odds are actually more in the favor of two rate cuts. Well, so I shouldn't say two rate cuts, a 50 point rate cut over a 25 point rate cut. So I'll start with this. I'll go to Jay because this is an economic topic and Jay's got to go first and Mauricio's going to be grumpy about it. But I'm going to start with Jay and Jay, lay it on us. What's going on? So, uh, well, I want to talk about, and we can get to it, I'll, I'll build to it, but ultimately where I want this discussion to go is I want to talk about like the downsides of this race rate cut. Cause everybody's been excited about it for like going on nine months or 10 months. Um, everybody's expecting it, thinks it's like going to save the world, but I think there's some downsides, but let's, let's step back. Um, let's start with how we got here. Uh, last week we got some inflation data and the inflation data basically said that Nothing's changed. We got some employment data. Employment data said, eh, basically nothing's changed. So essentially, uh, we're sitting at about 3%. Well, actually, inflation went down to 2.5% for CPI. Um, for PCE and core, we're around 3%. So inflation is uh, higher than the, the Fed target, but still relatively decent. Unemployment dropped a tenth of a point, so 4.3% to 4.2%, um, but the, the rest of the numbers were pretty status quo. So basically, uh, the, the point here is that nothing much has changed since Powell had, had kind of indicated that we were getting ready for a rate cut come tomorrow, and I guess it'll be today uh, when this episode comes out. And so last week, we were looking at about a quarter point rate cut um, with about 55% uh, uh, certainty half point rate cut at a 45% certainty. So the market was kind of pricing in a quarter point rate cut. Well, something's happened over the last 48 hours. I don't know exactly what it is because we, again, we haven't gotten any bad news. We haven't gotten any news that indicates that, that the economy is worse than it was a week ago or a month ago. Uh, but over the last 48 hours, the market is now pricing in about a two thirds chance of a half point rate cut and about a one-third chance of a quarter-point rate cut, which I actually find a little bit surprising because I, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, my prediction would have been three quarter-point cuts between now and the end of the year. So I don't know if you guys are surprised by a half-point cut, but I'm a little surprised. I'm, I, I still bet against it because I, I just think that a half-point cut is a admission that they've waited too long. Because we we know that they wanted to ease into this, we we know they wanted to start with a quarter, then a quarter, then a quarter. They've been kind of clear that that's what they, they want to do. And if they do a half point right off the bat, that's kind of them saying, "Oh, we 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 waited too long, we screwed up." And I think it's going to take a lot more than this for them to admit that. So I I still I'm still betting that they're only doing a quarter. 
and I think it also runs the risk of people starting to yell and scream that it's political and and that the Fed is taking a partisan uh, uh, approach to this, which, again, I, I thought a rate cut in July was warranted. I thought a 50 basis point rate cut in July was 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 warranted. So I don't really buy into the partisan thing. And we had an episode about probably almost a year ago um, where we talked about historically the Fed is is pretty nonpartisan. Um, but I don't think that's going to stop um, the, the the talk if they do a 50 point rate cut two months before the election or a month and a half before the election. I'd be surprised if they do a 50 percent, a 50 basis point, because the Fed's entire game is expectation policy. And they typically would telegraph that if they were going to do something more than 25 basis point, if they're going to go 50, some people even throw it 75. They would telegraph it. Then they would come out and they'd have their you know, board members on the media or press release or whatever. And so the fact that they haven't done it, I do, and, and, and I do think the, the, the election year does factor into it. So I'd be surprised if it's more than 25 basis points. But, but it's been over 50% like all week this week. So it's like, I feel like we might have, I mean, they, they have their little pet reporters that all of a sudden leak stories and do stuff like that. Like I, I know the Fed goes dark the week before the, the meeting, but like usually something gets leaked to, to sway us one way or another. And I feel like if they weren't doing a 50, they would have done something and they would have leaked something and they, they just haven't. So it, it's kind of perplexing to me. Well, the interesting thing is that uh, the market's predicting some major cuts before the end of the year. So if, if, the, if the market really thinks we need some big cuts, it may not be unrealistic that we start with a 50 basis point cut. But so here's, here's tomorrow, or I guess today, if you're watching this on Wednesday when it's released, uh, as of right now, 64% chance of a 50 basis point cut. This was actually 65% an hour ago, so it's still changing. If you look at November 7th, which is two days after the election, so I guess we don't have to worry about the, the the partisan talk at that point, uh, we're basically at, at uh, about an eighty percent chance of at least a three quarter three quarter point cut. And then if you go all the way out to December, just before the uh, the the end of the year, um, the market's basically factoring in a ninety two percent chance of at least a one point cut, and um, and about a sixty percent chance of more than a point point and a quarter or a point and a half. So I mean. The market is predicting a, a pretty big cut for over the next few months, and so again, if, if the market thinks that the the economy is in that bad a shape, maybe fifty basis points is warranted for for. Yeah, but Jay, can can you talk a little about since you're the the economic expert on the panel? Um, I'm a multifamily guy, by the way. What um, <laughs> what I mean, what effect is that really going to have? Because I'm looking at the ten year, right? The ten year, I remember. We were talking about the 10 year. It was like crossing almost 5% at some point. It's, it's come back down all the way to 3.64. And most of our, especially in real estate, right? Real estate, we, we're looking at, we care about mortgages, right? And mortgages is much more closely correlated to the 10 year versus the, the overnight Fed fund rate. So it sounds, sounds to me like it's already baked in. Like they're expecting whatever, the market's expecting whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And it's baked in this cut and interest rates have already come down to 3.65. Do you think if they do cut 25 or even, no, I guess that's why this point. one's interesting to me because yeah. it's, it's kind of up in the air. And so the, the, the market plays odds, right. And odds favor right now, the 50 bips, but it's still only 60%. So like either way, either announcement, I feel like the tre the 10 year treasury is going to move. It's just depends if it's a quarter, then it'll go up. If it's a 50, then it'll go down. It won't be huge, but like I, like I foresee going either way, depending on the announcement. And because and if you have these things where it's like, oh, 90 something percent chance of this happening, then it's already completely baked into the, the 10 year treasury. The 10 year treasury only moves on jobs reports and stuff like that. But like this will be the first time in a while where I think there's going to be a real movement on the 10 year treasury based off of what the announcement is. Yeah, so I I think there will be some movement, but the other thing to consider is that we are still in a situation where we have an inverted yield curve. I'm going to bring up a graphic here. So so th this is the yield curve, and and basically what this shows uh, in in normal times, it shows that uh, like short term Treasury bills, like the two month or the four month or the six month, are lower 
than longer term treasury bonds like the 10 and 20 and 30 year because, well, we need to get better yields on on if we promise to hold them for longer. Um, but what we're seeing and what we've seen for like the last 26 or 27 months for the most part um, is that longer term treasuries are now lower yield than shorter term treasuries. And that's called an inverted yield curve. And um, I know most people don't care about the details, but the important thing here is that as long as the yield curve is inverted, it can be very difficult to figure out how treasuries are going to respond to market news. Because we don't know when the curve uninverts which way it's going to do it. So are we going to have the 10-year uninvert, like the 10-year go up higher than the two-year, um, which means two-year might stay about the same, 10-year might go much higher? Or are we going to see the other way where the 10-year kind of stays the same and the two-year drops? Or are we going to see the two both move in, in unison? And so without knowing which direction the, the yield curve is going to invert with the yield curve kind of being messed up, I think all bets are off on what anything is likely to do with respect to 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 the ten year, and the reason the ten year is important for obvious reasons for well maybe not obvious to everybody, but the reason the ten year uh, yield is important is that's what drives mortgage rates. And so if we see the ten year come down, mortgage rates are likely to come down. If we see the ten year stay the same or go up, we're not likely to see mortgage rates come down. And so which we um, we want we want the ten year to come down, right? Like that's that's how we want it to happen. Oh, as investors, a hundred percent, we 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 want the ten year to come down. Um, and so, but I, I don't think it's obvious in normal times where we had a regular yield curve, um, a 50 basis point cut, or even a 25 basis point cut, I think would almost certainly push the, the 10 year down. Um, but in these weird times, I think it, it would push the 10 year down. I think it will. Um, but I don't think it's going to be point for point. I don't think we're a half point drop in, in the federal funds rate is going to lead to a half point drop in the but con conceptually. This is actually like the, the rhetoric going on right now of they're going to drop it faster. Isn't that bad for the yield curve? Because if by saying we're going to drop it faster, that's going to bring the two year down more. And that's going to make it harder for the the, the curve to uninvert, right? But that's a, no, but that's a, that is an important point. I mean, there is a distinction of how the curve uninverts because the, the 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 curve is going to uninvert. The question is how is it going to uninvert because the ten year and the longer end of the curve spikes up, which is more of a growth and inflation expectation thing. So that generally is viewed as a positive thing, or is it going to be the short end of the curve coming down? And so it's almost like everything's down. It's just that the shorter end dropped down faster than the long end. That's usually considered not a good uh, uninversion. So that's what people are watching. You know whether whether history repeats itself or not. We'll we'll see. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I do agree that that dropping the federal funds rate is more likely to hit the 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 two year than the ten year, just because um, the the Fed has more control at the shorter end of the the the, the curve. Um, but again, I, I don't think it's, it's a given other people are talking about the fact that, so maybe some of this is already baked in. We know that the fed with almost a hundred percent certainty is going to cut rates, um, at this meeting. We don't know if it's going to be 25 or 50 basis points, but we know for almost certainly they are going to cut. And so some people would argue that maybe some of that's already baked into the, into the treasury yields. Um, and we have, wait, 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 didn't I just say that like five minutes ago? You did. When you say some people, you should say, you know, like our co-host, the, the, the one and only. <laughs> well, but like there, I, there will be, so the 10 year might not move as much, but the two year, if we're talking about the two year, I feel like if they do a 50 bip cut, that's kind of like telling that, okay, we're going to start cutting aggressively. We're going to bring this down quickly. And I feel like there should be a lot of movement on the two year, which could benefit a lot of people. Like, you know, there's a lot of us who need two year rate caps. There's a lot of like... Uh, in, in commercial real estate, that could be a big, a big thing for a lot of people who've been waiting for a little reprieve on some of these things. So like, is there anybody else? Like, I, I guess, I don't know, which would be a better benefit and who's going to be the winner and the loser on either side of this, like, like to figure this out. But I mean, it depends on the reasons, right? Everybody, I think one of the, the things I've found is fascinating is everybody just assumes that if interest rates come down, that's good. It's like that blanket statement. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's like, why is it coming down? If interest rates are going down, because the Fed thinks things aren't going well and we need to cut rates, otherwise we're going to be in a tailspin, then that's not necessarily a good thing. Like interest rates may go down, but if we go into a huge recession and asset prices go down, that's not great for you either. Um, I was actually looking at the gold. That's another index. I mean, we've been focusing a lot on the 10-year, but gold is 
been for all you gold bugs out there, you already know, but I mean, gold is at an all time high. I mean, it's at $2,600 right now. I mean, it's literally over the last year, I'm just looking at the chart. It's gone all the way from basically about 1925 to 2,600. I mean, it's like a 30% gain. And yet, generally speaking, gold goes inversely with interest rates because the interest rates go down, it makes gold a little bit more attractive. So the gold market is definitely predicting interest rates are going to continue to go down. The question is why? Because if the interest rates are going down because we have deflation and it's like instead of growth, we have contraction, that's what I think a lot of people are concerned about. And that's what some people are interpreted the 10 year is showing is like, hey, the 10 year is going down. If the 10 year is generally growth and expectation, meaning the higher the 10 year, the more growth and the more inflation expectation, it means if it's going down, people have the opposite belief and things, things are contracting and, and deflationary or, or, or um, uh, disinflationary. Yeah, I think, I mean, the hope is that the Fed gets a good read on exactly where, what the trajectory of the economy is. And, and what was that? I said, good luck with that. Like, my hope is that the Fed gets a good handle of what's going on. I mean, come on. <laughs> okay, so let me say, say it this way. I hope the Fed gets lucky. And um, they, they kind of, uh, so, so in, in economics, there's this thing called a neutral rate. And for those listening that aren't familiar, neutral rate is basically what's that interest rate that will make the economy kind of buoyant. So it's it's not too high that we're we're pushing down uh un- or we're pushing down employment and jobs and we're causing deflation. It's not so low that we're seeing inflation and and and, no, and notice how the Fed learned its lesson on the two percent uh two percent inflation where they put a, a real number on inflation said we're going to two percent. But then they learned its lesson where they, they won't give the exact neutral right now, right? They say it's like, oh, it's somewhere two and a half, three and a half, like whatever. Like, yeah, I'm going to get on my soapbox right now because they have no idea. Like this idea that you have, how many, AJ, help me out here. How many, how many old white male with a couple of old white females are sitting on these boards and making these decisions? I mean, the idea that these group of individuals can be sitting around and looking at all this data and analyzing and these 13, 14, 15 people know exactly what the neutral rate should be or shouldn't be, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, it's like, it should be a function of supply and demand. And these guys trying to figure out what the interest rate should be is part of the problem. And then, and then on top of that, when they start making adjustments, it's not like it, we've talked about this before. It's not like you make a tweak on the interest rate and suddenly, okay, I got my results. It's like, there's a lag effect. So they, whatever, whatever twist they're going to make today, we're not going to see it in the economy for another Which three Which notice six, they haven't five, talked about in a while. In the beginning, that's all they said. When they started cutting rates, all they said was, this is going to take a while for these interest rates to work its way through the economy and for us to actually see the results of it. They were saying, in the beginning, they were saying six months, nine months, 12 months. One time they even said 18 months that it could take. For, but all of a sudden now we're data dependent and we're, we're working on the data that's happening in the moment. And they haven't said anything about how long it's going to take to work, it, work its way through. Well, let, me, let me finish my rant because this is something I just want to do. Let me, let me even, give me 30 seconds on my rant. But like interest rates should be a, a function of supply and demand. You have a say, pl- supply of money that's out there. People have saved their money. They've got money to lend out, and that's a supply of money. And then on the other hand, there's a demand for money. People want money to do construction projects, to build things, to grow businesses or whatever. And based on that demand and supply of capital will dictate what the interest rates are. When interest rates are too low, that that dissuades people from saving money. They don't want to save money because I'm only getting 0% or half a percent. So they save less money, which means there's an imbalance and therefore interest rates need to go up because there's more demand for the dollars than people are saved. And that drives interest rates up. And when the interest rates go up too much, then people are like, well, screw it. I'm going to save all this money because I'm getting a 10% return. And that creates like, you know, not enough demand. And so the, the, the interest rate needs to go down. That's who regulates interest rates. The fact that, again, these few individuals can sit around with their PhDs and, just, and decide this is the neutral rate. It's going to be 5.23% is ridiculous and and primarily a result of all these, one of the reasons we have all these issues going on right now. Uh, my, my take is that um, it's these old white men and women sitting around, um, not necessarily trying to figure out exactly what that number is, um, but basically saying, we know five and a quarter is way too high. There's plenty of evidence right now that five and a quarter is way too high. We know that zero or one is way too low. We saw that in 2020 and 2021. So there's a number between one and five that is the neutral rate. What's the number between one and five? 
eh, three is a number between one and five. My take is that's basically the analysis that they're doing. So we're somewhere in the three range, two and three quarters, three, three and a quarter, maybe even three and a half, but somewhere in that two and three quarters to, to three and a half range is kind of the common sense number. And I've never seen any analysis that's indicated that they're thinking more deeply than that. Maybe they are. Maybe they, maybe they have other data that they're looking at or other models. Um, but from everything I've ever seen, it's it's kind of like three, three and a quarters is between one and five. So let's let's pick that as the neutral rate. And I think it's a reasonable place to start. But like you said, but a lot of the asset prices have. I mean, I've definitely heard some arguments that, that that we're not there yet. Like we should be continuing to raise. We, we don't have people have been trying to bring down asset prices. The Fed has said they would not bring down asset prices. And I mean, the single family home market, for example, let's bring it back to real estate. What's the what's the median? I I know it's not a a national real estate market, but what's the median real estate pr uh, price for a single family home? Has that gone down yet, or is that continuing to rise? It's continuing to go up as of July. So it clearly didn't. So rising interest rates clearly didn't didn't botch that and didn't slow that rise up, and things are becoming more and more unaffordable to everyday. I, I don't. I don't think. I think that was an unpredicted result. I think they were worried about, and everyone was worried about housing prices going down and, and it was going to actually negatively affect the economy. And I think that was a, a surprising result as, as as to them raising interest rates. What about all these other assets? What about all these financial assets? They've all just continued to go up. None of it's slowed down based on these interest rate hikes. So there's, a, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a great, I don't know. That's my whole point. Like nobody knows, but there's an argument to be made that interest rates weren't high enough because things still Things are still you're, going you're, up. you're picking and choosing a couple asset classes, though, like in, in a couple of data points. There's a lot of other things like, well, let's look at commercial real estate. You know, that's a that's a pretty good data point that, yeah, interest rates had a pretty big effect on that. And like, you know, just job uh, job numbers that it seems to have had a pretty big effect on that now. So like it's you could pick and choose which data points you want to use. I, I'm going to argue back against commercial real estate. I think everything we've seen is that commercial real estate has been helped from a purely financial standpoint. Remember, the value of, of commercial real estate is based on two things, the, the income the, the property makes and the cap rates. And the income is, is the, the financial metric there. And what we've seen over much of the past four years, five years, is that income has gone through the roof. Now, it's slowed down over the last year or two, um, but it, it's hard to argue that we haven't seen tremendous income growth um, even over even over the last year when we've started to see a slowdown in other things. We've started to see a slowdown in inflation, a slowdown in, in, in employment, but we're still seeing incomes. It's just cap rates are, are going up with interest rates. And so- Yeah, but if you, if you go, if you take it back to right when they started raising interest rates though, and I don't like, I don't disagree with your premise um, because, but at the same time, I also think we saw such- big rental gains right before that, that, that rental increases have over that time of the increases in, in interest rates have flattened and sometimes even gone down and, and expenses continue to go up mainly insurance, uh, taxes, things like that. So it's, I, I, I don't disagree with the premise, but in, in, in practice, I think just because we had such high rent increases right before that, we were talking 14 to 19% in some areas, then they had to come back down to normal. So, so yeah, like it's, you got to factor that in as well. As a multifamily guy, I just needed to defend my my turf. Um, you may want to talk about winners and losers before uh, AJ falls asleep over here. Okay, so let's let's talk about um, let's talk about the downsides of rate cuts. Um, and so there's the obvious one, which is we risk inflation. So Mauricio, you've talked about this on this podcast for for a year now, two years now. Um, that like you we've don't been, think we've been on the air for two years? Nah, a year and a few months. Um, if you if you round up, but you have since the very beginning, basically your thesis is that we're going to see high inflation over the rest of this decade, even if it's not today or next week or next month, it's going to come back and it's going to come back with a vengeance. And what's going to lead inflation coming back? Inflation is is kind of the first risk of interest rates dropping. The second one is um, just the fact that um, four years ago, Kyle, you mentioned uh, earlier that 0% interest rates didn't stop people from buying treasuries in this country. And that's because uh, yields in other countries were going down by about the same amount. So you could still get well, a negative. Yield. 
<laughs> they were going, yeah, they're decently negative. And so zero was actually a, a pretty good result from, from a long-term bond. Well, these days uh, we see other countries, uh, their interest rates are not going down. If anything, their interest rates are going, continuing to go up. If ours goes down, then that delta between ours and other countries is going to shrink. And as that delta shrinks, there's going to be less demand for our bonds. People are going to have less reason to buy U.S. bonds when the the delta between their own country or their own currency and the ours. The majority of people that buy bonds are not foreign countries. It's the United States. The United States, we buy the vast majority of all our own bonds. And the only places that interest rates are still going up are not, like we're not talking about UK or Canada or most European countries. All of those have, like most of them have started cutting before we did. Yeah, but but as AJ pointed out, I mean, the main holders of, of our bonds is Japan and, and China. And those two are seeing Japan is potentially seeing rate increases. China is likely to see, um, uh, well, they were talking about rate increases. I don't think we're going to see that now. Um, but I, I think we're going to see a lot less demand for bonds. And given the fact that we are we are issuing so much debt these days, because obviously we're, we're, we're running the, the deficit so high, that I'm concerned that we may find ourselves in a situation where we have difficulties controlling the the yields on those bonds because there's just not enough demand for them. Historically, haven't haven't the government just stepped in and bought their own though? Like, yeah, and and if they have to, they'll do that. But I mean, how sustainable is that if you're still running two three trillion dollar deficits? That's my point though. When the government starts stepping in and artificially lowering it, it just disincentivizes me from saving money, which is what we need to do. We need people to save money so we can take that money and invest that into whatever it is we need to build and have a real economy versus just printing money and having lower interest rates. That's kind of the, um, anyway, I'm, I feel like I'm in a fighting mood anyway. So I'm just, whatever you guys say, I'm going to say something opposite. Well, speaking of economic collapses, should we talk about the collapse of, because we alluded to it with uh, our social programs and social security, should we kind of dive into that a little bit? And as- Kyle, I'm, I'm disappointed, Kyle. That was, that was such a beautiful segue and you screwed it up. Like next time, just say, speaking of economic collapse and then just go right into it. Like, let's just, that would make a much smoother money transition versus shall we talk about it? Just talk about it. I, I thought I thought we were doing a pretty good job, but okay, sorry. Some critical feedback there. That's all he's saying. It's all constructive criticism. You know, <laughs> I'd love to see to try to, to moderate one of these things with you hooligans over here. Anyway, fine. I don't even know what to say now. My my segue is ruined, even though it, it, I thought I was going on a good day. So AJ, speaking of economic collapse. Let's talk about the collapse. Go, AJ. <laughs> Great job, guys. <laughs> Nailed it. Stuck the landing there. Uh, so, yeah, basically, we're looking at the total unfunded obligations right now of uh, Social Security and Medicare um, uh, are responsible for 100% of our unfunded obligations. It's $73 trillion. We run out of money in nine years. Uh, well, I didn't realize 60- we were talking about social security. Are we running out of money in nine years? We can't pay for it. Or are we already out of money? Yeah, we, we have to caveat this. We'll run out of reserves. We will still we will still have money coming in that will be able to be, get paid out, but it will only be at like 74% or something of what is currently no, being paid out. not for those things. So we eclipse our ability to fund those obligations in total. So they cannot fund it. We'll, the first year would reduce a 20% reduction. So the uh, first year would be a 20% reduction in our ability to pay out, and it would be a gradual scale down from there. We, we are currently pulling from reserves every year in order to pay out these obligations, and our reserves are eventually going to run out. And so we would, we would- are those reserves like gold deposits that we have in some in some bank account or something? What I exactly they're, they're, reserves? Are they treasuries? Isn't that what? Oh, isn't that what oh, the, they're treasuries. Oh, interesting. So they're so they're like pieces of paper that the government writes to itself and says, "I owe you this much money," but it doesn't really have anything in there. Is that what you're saying? No, that is not what he's saying because treasure treasuries are unless you believe that the government can't pay its debt, and until the government can't pay its debt, treasuries are money. Treasuries are the most the, the safest store of value on the planet. In we don't really have any money to pay those treasuries back. We no. actually have to borrow no. a trillion Hold dollars to pay Hold those on. back. Oh, y'all right? stop! This is my segment. I'm taking control of it. <laughs> you, you knock it off. We're done here. Here's the issue. 
as of right now, not one candidate has a plan. So think about this. We're nine years away. The next candidate, whoever it is, right, gets in. Half the time to even get there. AJ, there are plans, though. The, the, first of all, Trump has a concept of a plan already. Actually, Trump has a much more detailed plan. So, And, Her- and Harris, plan- Harris is going to make the rich pay their fair share is always. Yeah, that's that's exactly what she says on her website. Like identical. Literally, she says, make the rich pay their fair share. Uh, So here is Trump's plan, which is not a good plan uh, because it won't take care of the problem. So uh, the proposal is ending tax on Social Security benefits. Um, He wants to actually give tax breaks uh, across the board on, um, the benefits that are received, which actually go back into paying it. It's weird. That's weird anyways, but it actually helps. Well, what's and, so, so I, I don't want to get derailed here, but do you, is a little conspiracy theory here. If they, if they took away the tax on social security benefits, wouldn't that technically let them cut social security benefits? It would, but then you would have to say cut and then you would never get elected. The moment you had to say cut. So you'd have to figure out another word, but you'd have to figure out another word, but you could, you could see like, okay, your net payment is going to be higher. So, so like conspiracy theory, maybe, maybe this is a way of them actually cutting social security benefits, but I feel like that's uh, may, maybe Trump could get away from it with it, but uh, someone like Harris, who's trying to get elected another but time. They're and- trying to increase it. So the whole idea is that they're actually increasing social security payouts through getting rid of the tax that has to come back. So they're saying you're going to receive more because now you don't have to pay taxes. on it. So that's the whole idea behind it, right? Now, there's a whole list of different items that they're going to do, it, but none even remotely Trump has comes to take care of this problem, right? So there, it doesn't come close to any way that we could even look at it to touching not only the deficit that is currently existing, but what we're running into. And uh, on uh, uh, Harris's website, she says we're going to make the rich pay their fair share and Americans over 400,000 are going to be subject to a social security tax without higher benefits. Um, well, what's the cap now? Isn't the cap like 100 and like social securities is capped 160? 168,000. Right. Yeah. So she's going to. Um, which which that was already proposed back in like 2020 and shot down. Right. So. I mean, we could try it again, get it through Congress, but you know, that's I, I guess that's that's Trump's position. What during that debate where he was like, "Oh yeah, you could propose all these different things; none of it's going to pass." Well, and when you look at it, the things that she's proposed, which are very little, basically just continued off of Biden's plan. It doesn't matter who you look at; both of their deficits will, or both of their plans, have an increase of deficit. Harris's deficits based upon what they're currently is looking at $2 trillion. Um, it's a harder to get an exact on Trump's, on his own plans deficit, but it's still in the trillions. It's not, neither one of them will solve it. We don't have any politicians that are campaigning or even giving anything that is going to solve it. Both candidates, even with what they've said, and even Harris's plan to increase this tax or to move it up to 400 from 168,000 to 400,000 doesn't even get close to touching the deficit. Cause I think the solution isn't necessarily, this is the part I'm not quite, I don't think the solution, I mean, part of it could be just raise the retirement age instead of saying it's 62 or 65. Now it's 70 or whatever. And based on our expectancy that, but the other way could just be like, Hey dude, we just don't have it, man. So it's totally unfair for somebody who's been paying into the system. Who's 62 years old. To suddenly come out and say, dude, you're not getting any, any of this money. Like that's totally not going to work. But if you're in your, if you're 25 years old, I don't have a problem saying, look, you're 25 year olds. Forget about the social security stuff. Like you're not going to have. Are you still going to pay into it then, Mauricio? If you're 25? No, no, there's no payment. You have to, because if they, it, but if the 25 year olds don't pay into it, like that's what's paying the current people who are drawing it. You're going to have to print it. Like you're going to have to print it out. Like that's the problem we have. 20 years ago, if we recognized this issue and just made little changes, it wouldn't be an issue now. But the problem is the closer we get to insolvency, the harder it is to fix it. Absolutely. And it's going to take that. And hence the reason when you look at our politicians plan and everything, nobody's addressing it. Then when it comes, they will do an emergency. But the, the odds are we will be downgraded over it. Right. 
And so you start to get downgrading over because we can't fund our obligations any longer. And it, it's going to come out to a few things. You can cut, you can borrow more, right? Which that seems to be the problem. But at that time in nine years, at the rate we're going, we're, we're borrowing off where we're, we're in a deficit of a hundred or a trillion dollars every 100 days. Yeah. But I think the more we talk about it, I think the, the reason this is a new theory now, so I'm, I'm literally developing this on the spot. So you put, so poke some holes into this, please. But I think the reason you're not hearing candidates talk about it is because they already realize we're already there. Like, it's not a huge difference. Like we're already, we're, we don't have the money. Like we're already insulted. We have a bunch of IOUs. We have a bunch of pieces of paper that are treasury bills. And the only way we can pay those is to tax or borrow or print. Like we don't have it now. So in nine years, Jay, jump in here. You're at that stage of drunk where you get quiet. And so first of all, have a couple more drinks. So then you get like giddy. No, and- I, I, I tried to, I've tried to jump in a couple of times and, and, and it hasn't been effective. Okay. Can, let, let me summarize. Cause I think uh, my outlook here is a little different. We have this you thing. Have three minutes. You have three minutes to summarize. Great. Three minutes. Okay. We've got this trust, social security trust. We collect Six thousand dollars a year from everybody, or whatever money we collect. Is empty. Yeah, the trust is empty. It is no, not empty. Stop. Stop. Empty. I'm, I'm talking. Paper. I am talking. The trust is not empty. Mauricio, you gave him three minutes. Let him take it. We got to restart his time now. Uh, the chairman, uh, I asked for my time back. Yeah, granted. Okay, so we've got this trust, and all this money goes into this trust. And then people take social security benefits and they take it out of that trust. And through 2021, through three years ago, there was always enough money every year coming into the trust to pay out the money that that was being paid for social security. In fact, there was a surplus. And so the trust built up. As of today, there's about $2.8 trillion in that trust. In treasuries? No. In treasuries. No? no. Yeah, it's it's in treasuries. And they're and and on that treasuries they're getting about 187 to 100 billion dollars a year in interest. So that's actually building up the trust even more. So we have our trust, 2.8 billion dollars and or trillion dollars in that trust. Every year, our shortfall this year is about 100 billion, not a trillion, about 100 billion. So we're eating about 100 billion into that 2.8 trillion this year. That's going to increase over the next 11 years. They just pushed it out from from. 2034 to 2035, but it's 11 years at this point before we run out of money. In 11 years, we run out of money. At the point we run out of money in 11 years, they're going to have to cut about 20% of the benefits because at that point, they're going to be taking in a a certain amount of money and they're going to pay all that money out. They're not going to have extra left over to to pay the difference. And so they're going to have to pay 20% less. What are you shaking your head? No. Why would they have to pay 20% less when you could just- Everything Jay is saying is correct. Let him keep going. It's actually 17% less. It's 83%. But, but why, can't, why can't you just do what we're doing now and borrow the 17% and put it in there? We can. So I'll get there. I'll get there. I'm, I'm, I'm recapping. So in 2035, we're now 17% shortfall. So one of three things has to happen. Either people are going to take a shortfall of 17% or two, we're going to increase revenue meaning people are going to pay more into into social security than that 12.4% that they're paying per year or three we're going to cut benefits and there is a fourth and I'll get there in a second but but these are the the, the three main things that can happen the third is we cut benefits what do we mean by cutting benefits isn't the, th- isn't the third and the first the same the third and the first are the same i'm sorry i you can either <laughs> you can either cut the amount of money they're getting generally when they talk about cutting benefits they talk about raising the retirement age right okay so one and, th- one and three are, are basically the same. Cutting benefits, there's two ways to cut benefits. You either get less money or you increase the retirement age. Either way, you're getting less money over the rest of your life, assuming they don't- Or we figure out for how to have people die sooner. Maybe just like exactly, COVID. Exactly. Um, or number three is what Mauricio was saying, which was we print more money and we fund it outside. There you go. There's the solution to social security. No more vaccines. Let, let, me, let, me, let me give you- so. If you want to fund Social Security for the next 75 years, starting in 2035, which is basically the lives of all the people that are currently working and are going to have to take out of it, to fund it for the next 75 years, $22 trillion. So basically, the shortfall in Social Security over the next 75 years is about 
sixty uh, percent of our our total debt, national debt right now. Not good, but not horrible. If you raise the retirement age by two years, you gain about twenty five to thirty years on Social Security before Social Security runs out. If you did that today. So Social Security, I actually don't think Social Security is that big of a problem. Obviously, politicians are terrified to talk about it. They know they're not going to get elected. But the reality is you raise retirement age by two years and Social Security is no longer an issue for this decade. Exactly. And that's why I said everybody gets mad when I say it, but it's the simplest, easiest solution. Well, and, and, you, can, and you can increase the income. You can make people pay more in. Yeah, but then you won't get elected. Now let's talk about Medicare because that's the Ponzi scheme in this country. Yes. And it's the two that are combined, which is the problem, because that's 100% of our unfunded obligations. It, it equates to. Okay. I, 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 cede, I cede the rest of my time if I have any left. I will yield my three minutes to your three minutes, because I think you were on to something decent over there. Go I mean, the, what, what it all comes down to is this, this program was established in 1940. So our 19 or like, I think it was later than that. It was, it was, we're basically like the hundred year mark right now. And there's been no major changes. You, you know what the average life expectancy was in 1940? 62. Okay. Right, right now, right now it's 78, 79, somewhere in between there. So if you adjust it, so it's like the accredited investor rule. Like if you adjusted it for, you know, when it happened, then the new retirement age would be 70. So 62 was basically three years before you actually retire. You would die three years before you retired. So now if your expectancy is 78, it really should be 75. Back in 19... I'll go to 1945 because 1940 is ridiculous. I'll go to 1945. Back in 1945, you know what the ratio of covered workers to beneficiaries was? 41 to 1. And then by 1965, we were down to 4 to 1. So that's for every, every worker how many beneficiaries were drawing off of that. Fast forward, you know what it is now? It's like two. So if you take those, the fact that everyone's living 15 years longer, so they're drawing the benefits longer, and every, and the number of workers to beneficiaries has basically been nerfed. It's, it's, cut in, it's been cut in half since 1960. Then, like it's it's just it's not a recipe. You, something has to change. You have to change the way the system works. Yeah, yeah. But somebody has to change. And just so that people don't think I'm a cold hearted bastard, I mean, I do think that it's really unfair for somebody who's bought into the system for all this time that's 63 years old, 62 years old, 64 years old to suddenly change the rules on them at the last minute. But the like design is unfair in general. The lowest income people. I would much rather go back on the front end and say, look. You're 18 years old. You're 20 years old. You've got 40 more years to figure this shit out. We're not going to give you any benefits or we're going to give you half of the benefits we originally. And if you're 50 years old, hey, you've got another 15 years. We're not going to completely cut you out because you've been relying on the social security scheme. It should be a tiered down system based upon how much you paid it. Yeah, like a tier down. But if you're 64, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. see how we can talk about what's fair, though, when we talk about social security. The people at the lowest level, they're at, they end up getting 70 something percent of what their income was during their lifetime. And the people at the highest level end up getting like 30 something percent, even though they're paying based off of their income. Yeah, but that's the promise. You 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 made that contract. I don't think it was a good contract. The, the, I don't think the government should have made it in the first place, but they made it. I think it's incredibly unfair. If they don't make it. No, 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 no. The government set rules. There's no contract. I didn't sign a contract when I was born. The government sets rules on everything. They set rules on speed limits. They set rules and they change those rules all the time. That's not how this works. If you have the money, you can pay for it. If you don't, the government needs to change the rules. It's not unfair to say that the government changed the rules on me because they do it all the time. I didn't sign up for that contract. The government says you do it or we're going to put you in prison. Yeah, but when you rely, it's like a legal principle. It's like when you, it's like a, it's in, in the law. We have this, this thing about it. when you rely on a certain principle and, and that was the arrangement you had or the agreement that you had, then to change that, you, you've been changing the behavior of people since they were, you know, 40 years old. Like instead of saying, hey, I'm going to go do my thing and save my own money and do my thing, it's become a safety net. Like, I know that when I'm 65, I'm going to retire. I don't think that's a good incentive. I think it, it actually hurts people, but that's what it is. And so now to come out when somebody's 64 and a half and is about to retire next year, for you to come out and say, hey, you know what? Now the retirement age is 67. I think that's a crock. 
So a perfect example we could use is when pensions go belly up. You put in your money to a pension for 30 years, and then it's mismanaged, and they go bankrupt, and you lose your pension. You counted on that. They told you you'd pay. You paid into it. But it doesn't matter if you can't do it. So it doesn't matter if there's a social contract. It doesn't matter if there is a contract. We've already made the decisions to not honor it. They're already spending more than they take in. Like you said earlier, that decision has already been made. They already made the decisions. They can't fund it for people that are 62. They have to change it because we already did it. We already have the consequences. It's done. Yeah, so, this, is, this is where my liberal piece comes in. It's like, I would much rather spend that, instead of spending money on bombs in Ukraine, I'd rather take that 40, 50, a hundred billion dollars and put it towards this unfair resolution for 60 to 65. But that's what they need to change. That's what I'm saying. So once again, stop spending bombs for Ukraine. I think we all agree. But what you can't do is nothing. And that's been the thing. They're kicking the can. What happens is like you, we were talking about earlier, if once the unfunded obligations get so big, it's too late to take care of them. But that's the way our government works. Our government does nothing until it's a crisis and it's not, it, it's not a, it's not an actual crisis right now because everything's working fine. It's the same thing with like when people talk about climate change, nothing's going to get done on climate change until it's a crisis because we could kind of say like, oh, it's not a problem. It's going to get fixed in the future. It's going to be one of those things. And that might happen. So people are just like, put it off. Let's put it off because it might fix itself. Who knows? But I mean, this is a lot simpler. We have a budget. We have income. We have expenses and we can see, and it's known exactly to the date. And so I think- We could have a rapture, AJ. We could have half the people in our country get uh, get raptured and everything will be solved. We could have a we could have another pandemic that t- knocks out 10% of the population and then, you know, it'll be solved. Like it's, y- y- you never know. So why would, as a politician right now- I don't think knocking out 10% of the population would do it. I think it'd take a lot more than that. Well, it depends what demographic of the population. If it was all the old people, then it would probably be. That's what I'm saying. COVID, COVID could have done it for us. We just should have done nothing. <laughs> Not that we sound like we're horrible people wishing for anybody to die. But um, and, and two, I think, though, once again, it comes down to the problem that we've moved off to both both parties. First of all, Democrats. You know what the difference between Democrats and re- Republicans are? Right. Democrats, uh, Democrats spend too much. And they want to tax for it and Republicans spend too much and they want to take out debt for it. At the end of the day, they both spend too much. So that's the problem. Democrats tax and spend. Republicans don't tax and spend. Yeah. And they both, we just utilize debt. They Wars, we used to pay for them, right? But that became very politically unpopular to tax for wars. And so you're right that we won't take care of these problems, right, until it's too late. We do have a big issue, though, that... As far as the public goes, this is like the last concern of the public. If you look at public polling, everything, people don't actually really care about this at all. People don't even know about it. Uh, this is fascinating. I don't know the answer, so uh, and I believe it. But like, even it's it's crazy to me that if you're sixty to sixty five year old, whatever that demographic, fifty five to sixty five, that they don't care about it. That to me it seems to me crazy. It is, but they really don't. And I you, I think that the discussions need to change because our biggest problems that we have right now, especially associated with this stuff, this is a a runaway train, right? Are not discussed. When you had the debates, not one time did they talk about cutting, uh, cutting spending. So I actually have a poll from 2022 and people are asked what their opinion of uh, social security is at the moment. And it actually, this, this poll breaks it into Republicans and Democrats, but um, 70% of Republicans had a positive outlook on Social Security and 82% of Democrats had a positive outlook as, as far as Social Security. Like, how, Wait, where, where it, are you forming that from? It's a known thing that we know it's out of money. It's like, and yet they have a positive outlook on it, right? Because nobody, because they don't care. Because they don't care exactly. Until it, until it affects them, it doesn't matter. Well, because it's the government's problem, right? That's what they say. We pay our taxes and the government's supposed to handle this. And that's something that they're going to handle. And we're not worried about it. Exactly. And so I think, once again, until we change the nature of the conversations, 
until we actually start demanding other things because we prioritize the stupidest stuff in this country. Like, it's kind of wild when you look at what politics and everything else have, has gone into. The things that actually matter, we're not discussing. Instead of it's just these stupid culture wars and really non-important things that they're talking about. And it's we're avoiding all these hard conversations. And we do not hold our politicians accountable for it. We don't ask them about it. We don't talk about it. They didn't mention it in the debates. They don't even, nobody cares, right? And so you guess it's hard to blame a politician when they represent us and nobody cares, but they really do care about things that don't matter. That's what's weird to me though. Like go back to 2020 and you can actually go on the social security website and you could see there's a, there's a thing called the um, proposals to change social security program. And it, it lists all of the like the subjects and the, the, what would happen. And if you go back and if you go through 2024, 2023, all is there is are like reports, their estimates of when, what's, what's going to happen and what the current status is and all that stuff. And it, every single line item is an estimate until you get back to 2020. If you go back to 2020, there was a flurry of stuff. There was Congress people sending letters. There was, there was updates to, to business plans. There was, there was people making proposals. There was all kinds of stuff going on in 2020. The COVID, the government took over everything and just started spending money on everything. And the deficits and everything got so big, there was a complete disconnect with the public earning money, spending money, and what the government will do. And I think it like screwed up the psyche of the nation, where all of a sudden the government can just pay for my stuff and I can sit at home and watch Netflix. And ever since then, nobody seemed to care about the spending. Nobody seemed to care about deficits. The trillions and trillions of dollars don't even make sense anymore because they're so massive. And the government can just seemingly print away our problems and I can stay home and they should just take care of everything. Like we got away from this stuff even making sense. And there was a sharp turn at COVID. And I really do believe it's because we disassociated ourselves with the fact that we could literally not do anything and the government would pay. They, they just took care of everything. And guess what? We're still doing the same thing today. I stopped working for a year and a half. I didn't do anything. Everything was taken care of. I'm now working and I'm pissed. I have to go to the office. That's the problem I have that I have to go into the office now. Why can't the government just pay for stuff so I can stay out? It, it seems like culturally we had some big shifts. And budgeting and finances, that kind of stuff got removed from a lot of the public discourse. And we see it in our politicians now. But I think the inflation is, is and I'm hoping that, and I think that's what's going to happen. Like if this, if this continues to get out of control, people will start realizing that when, when you print money, I mean, I always want to use the example of the coins, right? You've, you've seen the old, even today's coins, they have all those ridges at the end of the coin, right? Because in the old days, in the Roman Empire, you'd have a gold coin the way people would print, the way government printed money back in the Roman days was they would literally, and I mean literally, take a gold coin and shave off the edges to create a new coin. They were literally taking money from the money you got. And that's what's happening a little bit right now. When you got inflation at 7 8%, it's just because they're taking, when they print money, they're taking a little piece of your purchasing power. It's like taking your gold coin, shaving off one... 2% of that thing. And then every time you keep shaving off that gold coin, your dollar coin gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I think people start realizing that printing money is not free, that printing money takes away from my purchasing power, takes away from my income, takes away. That's why people suddenly realize, oh crap, I'm making the exact same amount of money, $60,000, $80,000 a year, but I can't pay for crap. I can't buy a house. I can't afford a house. I can't pay groceries. Kyle can't even buy eggs for crying out loud. And the reason is because as the government prints money, we're shaving off a little bit of my dollar. So my dollar is not worth a dollar anymore. It's worth 98 cents. It's worth 95 cents. It's worth 90 cents. And the bigger this thing come, becomes, the more purchasing power you have to take away from me. And at some point, I don't know. I think the pe people, I mean, that, I think that's the reason why empires fall is because people start realizing that's what's going on. It's not free money. You're actually stealing it from me. And that's what's going on. There's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. And I think that, you know, we start to see that in inflation, obviously. But I think you're right. There comes a problem where at some point it will change the way that we fund. 
Now, there's a lot of people that for some reason, this was like a big discussion like a year and a half ago where politicians were like, literally, they, they're, um, oh, what was that theory? Where they literally have a theory before inflation started that they could print that it didn't matter. There was no end to what we could borrow because it was, we were borrowing it for ourselves. So modern, a, modern monetary theory. Like they had a bunch of MMT kind of, but it was like, there's basically no limit to what we can, can borrow as the United States. They, they believe that, that there it's just endless. And the problem I think that obviously we get is there will come a time when that time comes though, I don't know that we can turn it around. That's the problem. And so, uh, you know, you get, because it's a self-reinforcing thing. All of a sudden now your debt costs more and interest rates go up. And the only way to solve the problem is so dramatic that you end up in a very violent outcome uh, because you're so far into deep. I don't know what that is. I, I, I don't, that could be 500% of GDP. I don't know. I don't know if it's 300. I don't know if it's 200. I don't know if it's 10 points higher than we are today, but at some point, you know, you start to wonder where I think the only reason we get away with it now is there's not a viable option that can replace us. It allows us to abuse it because we do not have any viable current infrastructure or currency that can be utilized. And that incentivizes us by the way, to make sure that there's not none of those things are good. And I really don't think so. And I, it, it's a concern that I don't think we have in our country and we don't talk about it enough. When is the point? When, when is when the we point? Hit crisis. That, it's the same time, the same as everything. It's not until it's a crisis mode that, that the government acts and that's when it's going to happen. So that's my, that's my theory on this that they're not going to do anything until we're literally on the precipice of collapse. And then they're going to have, they're going to have some act that they're going to make some f crazy name. It's not going to be like social security fixing act. It's going to be the, you know, the inflation the, reduction act. That yeah. It, it's going to be some patriotic name of how we're, how we're going to fix social security and Medicare. And they're going to do a little bit of a, of everything. They're going to increase the age. They're going to phase it out. They're going to make us pay more, a little bit more, and they're going to print a bunch of money. And that that's when it's going to get fixed right in the precipice of crisis. I don't know if anyone disagrees. Well, I, I, I was just, I did, did some quick back and napkin math after, you know, six drinks right here. But I mean, I, I just don't think that, I think the reason why, and I'm, I'm, this is a theory I developed on the show and I'm going to stick with it. I think it's a great theory of mine, but at the end of the day, the problem right now isn't that huge because we are spending $1.24 trillion in these social security benefits and we're bringing in 1.1 trillion right now. And so we're only, we're only in the hole, like, Point what, like $140 billion a year, which these days, $140 billion is nothing. So yeah, it's $140 billion this year, $140, and then over the next nine years, we get to, you know, we get to getting rid of all of our reserves. But at the end of the day, we still only have a $130 billion problem every year. We're just, we'll just print it. In nine years, we'll just print another $130 trillion, because if we're bringing in $1.1 trillion and we're spending one point two, even if that gap stretches, which I'm sure it will, you know, you know, maybe we only now instead of 1.24 trillion in, in nine years, we're doing 1.6 trillion. But the gap that we need to fund, it's big. But it, given that we're freaking spending a trillion dollars, well, and, and on the phasing it out and adding a couple of years to to the retirement age, then like it's plausible that that would. Yeah, it. that's why I think they're not concerned about it because maybe back in 2000, 20 years ago, oh my God, $200 billion or $300 billion or $500 billion. Oh my God. But now it's like, do you remember when we basically said the United States was communist when we bailed out the banks for like $200 billion? Remember that? And it was like people lost <laughs> was their so mind. much money back then. <laughs> and they, people, and this, this was what, what, 10 years ago. And people were like, we were full communist. We gave the banks $200 billion. Now? That's what you, that's what you spend on your, that's what you spend on your jet fuel for crying out loud today. It's like nothing, right? I mean, it's nothing, but it's crazy. We spend a trillion every 100 days. And, uh, I, I think that you're right. I think the losers is the world though. You want to know why? I think when that hits the fan, the United States is going to go whoop, pull everything out. We're not funding anybody anymore. Anything. We're not funding wars. We're not fun giving you weapons. We're not, we're, we're not funding your 
treats every it's just going to all come back and uh, they're going to let the world have to deal with itself i mean the amount of foreign aid and cost I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll have another topic sometime about the military. Yeah, we've already lost like, Jay, but... so we, we better move on to the top 10 because Jay's, we've lost him. Well, so, so yeah, so let, let's, uh, it seems like everyone's in agreement that it's not that, not as big a deal as everyone makes it out to, but it's, it's a big issue, but we know how it's going to get. It's a $140 billion a year problem. We, we never talked about Medicare and that's, and that's, and that's the much, 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 much bigger issue. I was kept when I talked about the hundred percent of debt, everything at the first Jay. I was covering social security. Well, we could do part two next week for you. We'll do part two next year, next week. We'll do part two two next week, uh, coming in 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 the difference between social security and Medicare, and why Medicare is a bigger issue. And we we never talked about the winners and losers, so we could probably talk about that next week too. But it was in my original numbers. (laughs) So so we didn't touch on anything this week. About we didn't talk about anything. We just an hour and a half, an hour and a half in, and we didn't touch on anything we were supposed to talk about. This show is like this, this show is like Seinfeld. We just talk about it's a show about nothing. I'm supposed to be the designated driver here. I failed you guys. I apologize. Jay, this is my fault. I'm so sorry. The designated driver is driving in circles here. You, you hit us with too many numbers at the beginning of the segment, AJ. And then AJ, know, we, we didn't by the really way, know. this is a really this is a really last point, and then we'll move on to the top ten. I didn't realize that you had a fake brick wall in the background covered by the black drapes is that just that's just stylistic thing right is it like i didn't re- or are there windows i guess there maybe there are windows back there oh it's the matrix it's the matrix right it's the matrix they changed it all right top 10 do we want a interesting one about this uh social security topic or do we want a fun one talking about how 1994 was the best movie mess best year of movies of all time only one of the only one of those is going to be topical yeah, I mean, I was looking at the analytics the other day, and I just when the top ten comes in, like our numbers just collapse. That is not true at all. So, they like, it just goes lie. from it just goes from whatever really high numbers because AJ and Mauricio just finished talking to just top ten, <laughs> and it just collapses. It has a little spike there, just a little spike at every top ten. So, what do we want? Do we want something that's topical about Social Security, or do we want to talk about the best year of movies of all time? Top ten Pisco drinks of all time. Piss and ginger, piss and cola, end of list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which one do you want? Jay, I'll, I'll give it to you. Social you're, Security, you're top two, make it quick. So, okay, so Social Security. So we talked about raising the age of Social Security. There's only, it's good for a top 10 because there's only about 10 countries in the world that have a higher retirement age for their Social Security pension programs. And so- if you look at that, the only, the only, so we're at 66 uh, is our, is our pensionable age right now. Um, and by the way, there's a bunch of countries that do different for men and women. So, you know, equality. There's Texas. They're sexist. Yeah, exactly. Um, but if you look at the, the countries that are higher in pensionable age, you look at Portugal, then Italy, Barbados, Greece, Iceland, Norway, Mexico and Israel. Israel is at the top. Pensionable age for men is 70. Pensionable age for women is 68. So there you go. The The US, we talk about raising our uh, pension age. We're already almost at the top. So I don't know how many people are going to be too happy. I think I think they raised it in uh, in France a couple of years ago, and there were like riots in the streets. They started they lower, yeah, they lowered it back down. There were like riots. They're like, I think it's lowering it. Yeah, there were riots. Yeah, so... There you go. There's there there's the in, interesting one. Even though I wanted to talk about nineteen, I know we're I, I know we're wrapping it up. But I, I want I want somebody to remind me. So when when Social Security started in nineteen forty, is that what we said? The retirement age was sixty five, but the average death rate was sixty two. Is that is that what you said? I just want to make sure that I, 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 that's still sticking with me. I, I yeah I don't uh, actually I I didn't I apologize I didn't pull up the stats of what the re- the <laughs> retirement age was back then I was just looking at the uh, you're right the, the delta should have been factored in I think we should use the same delta today that we did back in the 19 19- that's my point like I think whatever the delta was back when they passed the law we should upgrade update that just like the accredited investor rule we should update that to even whatever the accredited investor rule hasn't been really updated much since 1980. No, it's but well, that's what I'm saying. Long. Like in 19, yeah, like in 19, if you adjust a million dollars for inflation, you're at three million. If you adjust the 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 
the, the retirement age to average death rate, I think we should use the same ratio. So fun fact, um, between 1937, in 1937, the, the retirement age was 65. Between 1937 and 1959, every couple years, it would go up by about two months. And so between 1937 and 1959, it went from 65 to 67. Since 1960, it's been at 67. Wait, so the the retirement age was what? What did you say? 65? 65. The, the life expectancy in 1935 was 60. Yeah, that's the whole point. It wasn't meant to be a retirement plan. But let's, but uh, not to get off a tangent, but. But let's make sure that, you know, the life expectancy is based on when you're born. You've got all the childhood. Yeah. But if you look at what is your life expectancy when you turn 60, it's way more than 65. Like once you hit 60 and you've gotten past all those infant mortality problems that you have, your life expectancy at 60 is way higher than 65 or 70 or whatever. But still, you're adding more people in. No, 100 percent. No, I'm with you. I, I would love to see that. I want to see the stat. I want to know the stat. Okay, we finished the segment. Sorry, we finished the segment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right. Jay, you got any plugs? Yeah, um, I am going to plug again this week, but for a better reason. Uh, the American Apartment Owners Association, they have their uh, their conference coming up in October, and they now offered for drunk real estate listeners a free uh, a free ticket to their live stream. If you, if you want to watch uh, the live stream in the comfort of your own home, you can get a free ticket um, just for drunk real estate investors or listeners. So uh, if you go to the, U if you're not watching YouTube, go to the YouTube version of this. And in the description, I will put the link and the coupon code for your free ticket to the uh, AAOA conference. See, this is where I disagree with this. I think you should be promoting the drunk real estate uh, newsletter and for those who register for the newsletter, they would then get the free live stream. You can do it that way too. Either How way. How do I get, I want to promote drunk real estate newsletter. We, you, we do a, a, a daily synopsis of economic news. Jay, how do we get a hold of, how did somebody sign up for drunk real estate newsletter? D-R-E for drunk real estate, D-R-E daily.com. Just go to D-R-E daily.com. Give us your info and you'll start getting your daily updates on the most pressing economic topics and breaking news. Like this week, the the avocado or yesterday, the avocado slicer, right? No, that was in that was in a competitor newsletter. <laughs> you should you should read our newsletter, Kyle. All right. Um Mauricio. <laughs> I, I already promoted drunk uh drunk real estate newsletter, and I'd like to promote AJ's uh, beard oil. What do you use, AJ, to keep that beard so shiny and be luscious and beautiful? You'd be funny, AJ. One time you should put a fake beard on Ernie in the back right there. So like two of you would be twinning. That would be kind of funny. Um, AJ, you got anything to plug? Uh, I have my event next week. I'm super stoked about that. This is the one that none of us are invited to? Uh, it's the one you guys never come to. You're always invited. Uh, you, you guys said, were you going to come last year, remember, and you ditched me? I had, like had, I had the stage ready for your podcast and everything. Jay was going to come and then you guys were like, oh yeah. And then one of you, each one of you dropped out. Jay was holding strong last minute. First of all, it's always been my position. If, if everybody else is going that I'll go, which is, and second, I wanted to go to your event more than going to limitless, but everyone was already going to limitless. So I had to come. So it's, you can't put this on me. We should be going to everybody's next year. We're doing, we're going to AJ's event for sure. All four of us, including AJ. He's going to go to his own event. I will. AJ, AJ, get Alex to clip that for you. So you could throw it back in Mauricio's face. <laughs> I will. But speaking of all of us going somewhere and AJ not going, the mm -hmm. three of us other than AJ are all going to Cancun for the bigger pockets conference, October 6th to 8th. And actually we at Drunk Real Estate have another ad coupon code for that as well. 500 bucks off. You actually have you to do? type in Conference Connect. Yeah. So go in and you get a, a vacation built in and you get to meet three quarters of us and hang out and we'll do a lot of drinking. Why, 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 why Conference Connect? What is that? Well, that's just our coupon code. But what is Conference Connect? Well, that's, our, that's another one of our business websites. That's, that's your elevator pitch? It's one of our businesses' websites? I don't want to get too many pitches in. It gets too pitchy. Well, I'll pitch that another time. All right. Uh, that's all I got.
I've been my drink's been gone for so long, so I can't even say like act like it just happened. It's been gone and for Jay's a really long time. Jay's drunk and has been out of it, so let's wrap it up. <laughs> well, Jay did a good job of not getting to the silly drunk though. Like he got he he didn't move through all the progress stages of being like super drunk, Jay. So he did a good job. He got to the like I'm getting a little tired stage and just I stayed, stayed awake. I get credit. You, you could tell by his eyes, even though there's no, no reflection in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, good hanging out, guys. See you next week, all of us. See you next of week. Of course. All right. So uh, my drink's gone. I'm going to go hit the head. I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>